Hey guys, Max here and this is your daily market update for yesterday the 8th of February. We will of course look at the equity markets, some rather odd and slightly sinister updates on the Chinese markets and a couple other things so let's just get right into it. Now what actually happened with the markets? Well we saw some fair bullishness. Equities all over the world really rose by a little bit. The S&P 500 was up 0.8%, the Nasdaq was up 1.2% by the end of the day, the Nikkei was up half a percent and the stock 600 was up 0.1%. Now, why did we see this limited bullishness? Well, over in Asia, there have been some rather shady developments regarding the Chinese state. Basically, the CCP is artificially raising asset prices of Chinese companies, including those listed on the Nasdaq, for example. And we will go into a bit more detail in this in a bit. In Western markets, though, there are just some better looking forecasts for companies' performances into the future, leading to gains just across the board by a small margin. There wasn't one specific thing or news piece that gave us this bullish day, it's just general market sentiment coming and going, and for today, it was coming. Now, as interest rate hikes are getting closer and closer, and as we are expecting rather poor inflation data to come through this month, bond yields have risen, and the US 10-year Treasury is now sitting at a 1.96% yield, which is the highest it's been in over two years. The mostly strong earnings reports from companies over the last week have pretty much just been enough to stop the markets from crashing as they did throughout January, despite the fact that the outlook regarding inflation is not actually getting any better. Now, outside of equities, what went on in the markets? Well, oil prices saw a slight dip, which to be honest is really nice to see because they have been sky high and it would be great if they continue to fall. WTI crude is now sitting below $90 a barrel, only just below at $89.80, but under $90 nonetheless. Gold saw another modest gain for the day, rising 0.3% with it now sitting at $1,826 an ounce. Now, as for the crypto markets, there weren't any major developments, but we did see some small declines across the day. Most coins fell somewhere in the region of 5%, but Bitcoin and Ethereum mostly held firm at about $44,000 and $3,100 each respectively. Solana was down 5%, Luna was down 6%, almost every altcoin was down something like that for the day. There wasn't really any major news that caused this decline, it's just the pump over the last few days has lost a little bit of its momentum, and so here we are. Let's also not forget that just a couple weeks ago, pretty much everything was down something like 20 or 25% compared to what it is today. So the market right now is looking all right. And of course, there was a big piece of news regarding stolen Bitcoin being seized by the US government, which we will cover in a bit more detail tomorrow. Now, what has been going on in China? Well, apart from the Olympics being exposed for being fraudulent and with lots of cheating from Chinese participants going on, which again, we'll cover at a later date, everything has been falling apart for months now. And finally, the CCP is starting to take some direct action to try and hide all of this chaos in the markets. The other week, we saw a coordinated action as a dozen of the company's largest financial institutions all started buying up equities at the same time and making statements saying that it's their patriotic duty to buy the dip and make sure that the markets don't crash. Now, this was pretty crazy to see, and most people just sort of ignored it for the most part, but this almost certainly came from the top of the CCP, and it is market manipulation at its finest. Banks and other institutions were literally being forced to buy up assets by the CCP to inflate their prices and to disguise the market route that has been going on for about a year now, and this is insane. The last few days though, it has gotten even worse, as now literal state-run investment funds have started buying up Chinese companies' stocks as well, and in particular, US-listed Chinese stocks. Alibaba and Pinduo Duo, for example, rose 6% and 13% each in one day alone as the Chinese state flooded the market with buy orders. Now, they've actually been surprisingly transparent about what they're doing. They've literally said that they're buying up stocks to stop the markets from routing and falling as they have been, which is pretty crazy. It's also oddly similar to Abenomics, the policy pursued by Japan over the last decade, where the state just started buying up assets and equities in order to inflate their values and hopefully stimulate the economy. Unfortunately, after 10 years of this going on in Japan, it's very clear now that it doesn't work, and every economist in the world will tell you that it simply doesn't work. To be honest, I really can't see how this will go in any different direction in China either. All this will do is increase the liabilities held by these Chinese-run banks or the Chinese state, 
and inflate some asset prices a little bit. This won't help confidence return to the markets because everything is so obviously just being propped up by the Chinese state. And let's not forget that this is the same Chinese state that caused this massive market route in the first place as they started attacking tech companies in China because they doomed them to be too influential and profitable. Very simply, this is not an investable environment and artificially manipulating prices on the stock markets to try and make up for destroying the markets in the past is no better and China is not going to become an investable environment anytime soon. Can we expect this to continue for at least a bit? Yeah, we probably can. The banks were doing it a couple of weeks ago and that was a precursor to this and the state-run funds doing it themselves today is the CCP doubling down on this idea and I wouldn't be surprised if they took it a little bit further as well. Now, of course, all of this goes down as the property market continues to fall as well. The real estate crash started over a year ago now with the implementation of the three red lines policy. And while it took a while to develop, property prices in China have now been falling every month for five months in a row now with no sign of stopping. This alone is very damaging to the investing environment in China as Chinese real estate is the biggest singular asset class in the world and it makes up the vast majority of Chinese citizens wealth as well and that fall is still ongoing and there is no sign that it's going to stop. Now in Chinese and American relations, which have obviously been bad recently, but they are getting worse. It has emerged that China failed to meet the requirements of the deal that they made with Trump back when he was president. Basically, they agreed to purchase a certain amount of goods from the US to help rectify the balance of trade issue, but they came up 37% sure of what they were supposed to do, and now the US is quite unhappy with them. Now, no one should really be surprised that they lied here or that they hid their lies from the US as well. The CCP is a genocidal authoritarian state who puts the party's interest before everything else, even their own citizens, so this is fully expected. Now, a US senator has also come out and said that China should be sanctioned for what is going on in Xinjiang against the Uyghurs, and he's absolutely right. The democratic world should not sit idly by as this awful stuff goes on, even if it means companies have to shake up their supply chains and move production to other countries. This is part of a wider shift in US politics to actually start speaking out against these atrocities and the evil doings by the Chinese state. We saw similar stuff with Peng Shui, the Chinese tennis player who basically disappeared overnight and we've seen the same sort of thing with China's actions in the South China Sea and with their actions towards the country of Taiwan as well. Now it is good to see this shift in politics even if it did come many years too late and even if it does need to go far far further if we actually want to see any positive change in the world. Now in Europe electricity prices are soaring and they're set to get even higher as France has been forced to reduce its forecast for energy production from nuclear power. This is of course coming at a time where energy security is a hot topic issue. Natural gas is incredibly important for Europe's energy needs, not only for generating electricity itself, but for simple things like cooking food and heating people's homes as well. France is a major producer of electricity and thankfully they've invested heavily into nuclear power over the past few decades as if they hadn't the situation today would be far worse than it is right now but unfortunately the amount of electricity they are able to generate into the future is decreasing. Of course, this is also happening at a terrible time. Russia holds huge amounts of leverage over almost every country in Europe because of the lack of energy security, and Russia is well aware of this and they're willing to use it as well. I think it's pretty safe to say that if Russia weren't such a big energy exporter, then everything with Ukraine wouldn't have gotten to the point where it is today. Now, in that same sort of vein, Macron went over and spoke with Putin, supposedly to try and de-escalate the situation in Ukraine, and this was a big moment for Macron, as he'd spent the last five years courting Putin, trying to get him on his good side, build a positive relationship in order to be in a position to make a difference when something like this Ukraine situation comes up. Now, coming away from that meeting, Macron was very happy to announce that he had been successful, that tensions were subsiding, that Russia had made promises to him that it was not going to escalate the situation any further, and all was okay. The only problem is that it seems like Macron got played a little bit, unsurprisingly. Almost immediately after Macron claimed everything had been solved, Putin came out and said that that was all a lie and it was untrue. He said that no agreement had been made, that he wasn't going to withdraw troops from Belarus on the Ukrainian border, but most importantly, that as France is not the head of NATO, no agreement could have been made by them anyway. Now this is a kick in the teeth for France and Macron, it's a pretty huge failure and it's an embarrassing one as well because Macron came out seeming so optimistic. 
There are, of course, a few more updates regarding the whole situation in Ukraine, but we're going to get to that tomorrow or else this video will just be too long. Now, in some little bits of random news, Joe Biden finally acknowledged the fact that Tesla is actually the biggest electric vehicle maker in the US and in the world as well. For the last few months, Biden has been going to events and speaking at conferences, congratulating Ford and General Motors about how their investments into the electric vehicle markets are pushing the US forward into the forefront of the industry, and it's all been a little bit laughable. He has basically just pretended that Tesla doesn't exist, and this is coming from someone who doesn't own any Tesla stock, I don't own a Tesla car, and I don't want to own any Tesla stock or a Tesla car either, but Biden's ability to just feign ignorance has been pretty impressive here. And yesterday, Biden finally changed his tune, and he finally acknowledged that Tesla exists, and it was actually a little bit nice to see. Of course, this is all to do with lobbying and funding Biden's and the Democrats' campaigns in general, and there shouldn't be any surprise that Biden has been behaving like this, but this is a step forward if nothing else. Now, in some more random news, the Spotify situation has been evolving as you would expect. There is still an awful lot of pressure on Spotify to ban Joe Rogan, to stop him from speaking and publishing his views and the views of his guests, all in the name of supposed COVID misinformation. Now, Neil Young, who has been spearheading this drive, obviously took all of his music down off of Spotify to try and force the hand of Spotify, and it didn't work, but he's not stopping there. He's now endorsing Amazon Music, trying to help one of Spotify's competitors in a roundabout way of trying to damage Spotify itself. Now, a fair amount of double standards are being brought up here at the moment, specifically around the fact that these people who are furious with Spotify for allowing Joe Rogan to exercise his free speech, well, they seem to have no problem with two other people being on that platform instead. Those people are Bill Cosby and R. Kelly, both of who have their content on Spotify and other streaming sites as well, and these people are profiting off of this as well. Both of them are literally rapists, literal full-on real rapists. R. Kelly is also a convicted child sex trafficker, but literally no one who is angry with Spotify over Joe Rogan cares about any of this, despite the fact that R. Kelly is a literal paedophile. Personally, I think it's insane that this is where people's priorities lie, that they would rather try and infringe on people's rights to speak freely, as opposed to trying to stop child rapists to be able to profit from these same streaming services. If nothing else, it shows a gross miscalculation on the side of morality from these people seeking to tear Joe Rogan down. Now that is it for today. I will be back tomorrow, of course. If you enjoyed this video, then leave a like and a comment to bless the YouTube algorithm. If you want more content like this, then check out our Patreon and join our community of investors. You get access to our Discord, loads of exclusive content like insight into my portfolio and buying sell alerts for all my own investments. It is now February, so if you've been waiting to join, now is the perfect time. There's a link in the description to masterworks.io, a site that allows you to buy fractional shares of art from world famous artists like Banksy, which can be a great way to diversify your portfolio with non-market correlated assets. It's completely free to sign up. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to hand over any card information. So if that sounds interesting, then make sure to check it out. There's also a link in the description to BlockFi, which will give you up to $250 in free Bitcoin when you use it. You can also get 9% interest on stable coins like USDC, which is a far higher rate than you'll get from any savings account these days. Just make sure not to use Tether. Thank you all for the support. Thanks for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.